Thank you guys. Um, so just briefly, I know some people were there that evening. I really recommend that you guys go to those um, entrepreneurship club because even if you don't have an idea, the process of thinking through concepts and thinking through how to look at the world from that perspective will, I, I promise you, will change your, your lives when it comes to your success because whether you work for a company or you start your own business, it doesn't matter. You can be an entrepreneur at both and it really is a huge benefit for you to be able to think through concepts like that and actually put pen to paper and say, okay, this is, this is what the, the prospects are and here's how you get there. So just a background about me. I, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada and I was born and raised down there. Um, I went to um, school and I was always interested in kind of uh, making money. And so as stupid as, as it sounds, I'd go to Costco and I'd buy bulk things of gum and I knew that gum wasn't allowed at school. And so I would sell gum to my friends and people in classes and then t I would take the profits of that and then I rolled them into a, um, a uh, landscaping company. And I would go up and down the streets and I'd set up ways of doing landscaping more efficiently so that I could hire my buddies and we could actually have money to do paintball. And um, so, so that's kind of where my entrepreneurship life began. And through, through doing that, I just realized that you don't have to be the most genius person to, to succeed in entrepreneurship. I am not a book smart person. I actually failed the two freshman classes at SUU my first semester here and lost my scholarship because of those two stupid freshman classes. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm not a book smart person. I, I really have to apply myself to actually do well when it comes to studying and, and uh, I'm not a good test taker. But but, I, but where my, that's my weakness, but where my strengths come is in the ability to kind of see the world in a different perspective to, to look for ideas. So I was right after high school, I was brought into an apprenticeship down in Mesa, Arizona to do um, high-end finished carpentry, crown molding, baseboard, closets, cabinets, anything that people would put into a, a multi-million dollar home. We, my company, that's what we did. And I learned this apprenticeship for three months and realized hey, I could do this. And so I went and bought all my own equipment um, from what I made that summer. And each time I would buy a, another piece of equipment if I had a job that needed something different. And as I started this company, I realized that, you know, being the one behind the hammer, it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. But that wasn't how I was going to be able to grow my future and, and be able to actually make millions or billions of dollars someday. Um, and so I, I realized I needed to go back to school. And so I went, I went back and I, I actually played volleyball at a, at a university back, back east and started into, a, into the business program over there. And while, while in that program, I decided to serve a mission for our ch my church and went on a mission. Now, nothing in my life goes just as simply as going somewhere and it just working out. So I was sent home twice on my mission to have medical, two surgeries um, take place. And I was originally called to St. Petersburg, Russia. And, and during those times, you know, that I was sent back, it was, do I go back to school? Do I, what do I do, right? It, it was this limbo state of if I decided to start a, or go back to school, I, w I was deciding not to go back on my mission. If I decided to do something else, I was deciding not to go back on my mission. So I was kind of stuck in this little limbo state and it was probably the worst, most depressed time of my life. And, and so, you know, starting a company was a great opportunity because I could stop it when I wanted to. I could pick it back up when I wanted to. Um, and so I, I restarted up my, my um, uh, finished carpentry company that I had sold. And I picked it back up, picked up my, my old clients and started to do that again. And it allowed me to have that flexibility to kind of, if I decided to go back, I could go back. If I decided not to, I could kind of just keep running the business and, and make those choices as they come. And finally finished my mission, met my wife. I came back actually to SUU for a semester the second time I was sent home. Um, and I was in the show choir that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Acclamation. It used to be a, a recruiting tool that we used um, around the country to get people to come to, to SUU. And I was here for only a semester and then went and finished my mission. Um, and I met my wife during, during that time I was back. 
And so when, we, when I came back, we decided we were going to go somewhere that we could afford uh, that because we were both out of state residents, we couldn't really afford to, to come back. So we went up to BYU, Idaho and we finished up there. But before we got married, one key thing that conversation that we had was that um, we, I said to my wife or my fiance then that I said, so you kind of know my personality. I'm kind of a type A personality. I just want to head down the path. I have a very addictive personality. So when I start something, um, it's hard for me to stop doing it. So because of that weakness, I knew, I knew that once I got going in my career, I would really focus on my career. And sometimes things would take the back seat to that. And so I said, if you'll be an amazing mother and a wife, I will be an amazing husband and provider. And and so she, we agreed to that. That was our, kind of our, our relationship. We agreed that that was going to work in our relationship. And I can't tell you how many times that saved my marriage um, throughout the eight years we've been married um, because Ernst & Young is like 90 hour weeks, 120 hour weeks. Startups are that or more. And so there was a lot of times when we would have a brand new baby at home and I was on a plane somewhere doing something. And... And so, but she, she's told me many times since then that she could go back to that time and said, okay, that's what we agreed to and we're doing it for a reason. It's not just so I can work myself to death till the day I die. It's so that we can have the flexibility to move to Cedar and still work in Vegas and, and have that flexibility at, at a young age. And so that it was a key thing to, to grow, um, to being able to succeed in business. The, the next thing is I started a, a business while I was in college. Um, we, me, I found a partner. We started a photo booth business that we did um, large events or weddings or, or things of that nature where we, we built the photo booths ourselves because of my background in construction. Um, we, we developed the, the process of using technology and we, we made some cool things that bridged the technology to allow it to be a more kind of fluid Thing. This is a long time ago before photo booths were popular at weddings. And so we were the first to market up in Idaho. And doing that, I didn't make tons of money doing that. I, I actually gave up every weekend um, going to weddings and events. But what I did learn from that is how to manage people, how to, you know, look through the, the financials and see how you're doing, what the costs are associated with running one single event, what does it cost to print one single strip of paper, do we give them unlimited or don't we give them unlimited prints, because we could do the math to see if they used it specifically the entire time with no breaks in between how many prints they max could use. And so we could calculate out exactly what it would cost worst case scenario and best case scenario to see what our margins would be. And so going through that process of running that business, I mean, I ended up selling it and making an, enough money, but nothing, nothing impressive. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't make millions. I didn't, I didn't really set myself up to never have to work again. But the lessons that were learned from starting that business in college where if I failed, who cared? I lost a couple grand or a thousand bucks or whatever. And like, yeah, that's a lot, but think about what you invest in your education. I promise you that type of education is what can bridge the gap between setting you apart from a business major and another business major or whatever you're going into and that and that another person that's applying for that same job. If you can set yourself apart with those types of things where you can show here, here's why I can think differently. Here's why I can look at your business and come in and take an active role in helping this business grow you will get a job over any other person guaranteed if you have that type of background and, and feel confident in talking to that when you're in an interview. Um, so I sold it because I was leaving to go um, to the Bay Area to Ernst & Young. Now Ernst & Young is one of the big four accounting firms and so I thought, okay, to actually succeed in entrepreneurship, because I never wanted to be an accountant. Never had any desire, my dad was an accountant. Um, my dad's a pretty dry personality, and so I just didn't see that as me growing up. I, I saw a lot of accountants, and they looked like pretty boring people. And so I just thought, you know what, I can't do accounting because that will drive me crazy. And it wasn't until I 
got through my business and I was, I was doing a few things there. I was the head volleyball coach at the um, high school down there, or up there. I was the president of the association of the volleyball um, association up there. And so through, through some of those things, I started to realize that I didn't have a technical expertise that I could sell. And so I started applying at different places, talking to people that had worked at different um, big four accounting firms because I knew that you know, that's a huge name and I didn't want to go to New York and do investment banking, which is kind of my original plan. So I started talking to Ernst & Young and they said, okay, well, yeah, absolutely, we'd, we'd, we'll give you an offer to come out and work here. And as I got out there, they immediately put me in the IPO division of the company. <coughs> IPO meaning initial public offering. These are the companies that have finally made it. They're going to go onto the stock market. They're going to sell a big amount of shares, and then they and then those are in turn sold to you and me on the secondary market um, on the Nasdaq or or one of the stock exchange. And so to go through that process is a very expensive, long absolutely insane process and so we what we would do is we would show up with these companies we'd audit last five years of their financials we'd bring that to back to the company then we'd sit with the investment bankers we'd sit with the we'd sit with the lawyers we'd sit with the accountants we'd sit with their company and we'd all go to a place called um, oh no I'm not I'm not gonna remember oh the writers writers and so it was a, just this building where you would show up and there were, there, were, there were offices and rooms and little nooks and crannies everywhere that you could, you would bring your, everybody into this room and you guys would knock it out in three days straight. No, no one would go home. There was cots, there was, there was showers and you would just, you would get everything written up, you'd change what you needed to change, you'd redline out the entire, um, it's called an S1 before they deliver it to the stock exchange. Um, this makes them legal to, to sell their, their shares. Um, and we would sit there and you would be there three days straight. It was horrible. Um, but you learn a lot through that process. You're sitting with very intelligent people who understand business way more than I would. And so I would take notes and I would sit there and, and it had nothing to do with my job. I didn't need to take those types of notes. But I would take notes on what they were discussing, what was making it, how do you, how do you, how do you position this business to people so that they want to buy it. Because if you don't know anything about, let's say, oil, the oil industry, how do you get excited about buying that stock? Um, if you, or, or any industry for that matter. I was dealing mainly with just technology companies, Facebooks, Googles, LinkedIn, Netflix, all these companies. We would, we would do stuff on Chegg, if you've ever heard of Chegg. Chegg is a student services company that you can rent books from. So I brought them public while I was there. And, um, and so through that process, you just started to see, okay, what gets a company to be able to actually make it, really, because that's going going IPO is really what entrepreneurs consider making it. You make, I mean, when when Facebook went IPO, they were the first company to ever go uh, become a hundred billion dollar IPO, and that was unheard of, and it made everyone that started that company multi billionaires just in a few hours. Um, but everybody sees that few hours and doesn't realize everything that came up to that point. And that was what I got to see. I got to see these companies grow and what made them, because I had to audit five years of their financials. So I got to see how they grew, what, where, they, where they cut products, where they added products, where do they cut revenue streams or added revenue streams. And this allowed me to be able to take some of that knowledge into the next job, which was venture capital. And so with venture capital, it's an it's a interesting world because they come to you. They come to you and pitch you on their idea and they say, okay, here's why we need this money, and here's what we're going to do with it, and once we have this money, we can grow this big. And so in venture capital, being kind of um, coming in from the background I had, they, they put me in charge of the entire Utah, Nevada, and Arizona division, and the company I worked for was called Huntington Capital, and they had taken, they were, they, they took money from like, pensions and places like that and that's how they raised their their fund and so I was part of a hundred twenty million dollar fund for them and I, I ran all of the deal flow for those three states and it was just interesting sitting on that side of the table because you're sitting here staring at these people and you're like you do what and you're making how much and so it was just simple simple ideas I mean some of them were super high-tech way above my head but 
most of them were just very simple ideas of somebody who found a niche in the market or a, or a target set of customers that weren't being serviced by the traditional companies today. Um, one example I use is, so you have Netflix, um, you have Hulu, you have VidAngel, you have HBO Go, you have, um, uh, there's a million of them, Amazon Prime. What, what do they all do? What's different about them? Let me know. It's just service oriented. It's it's streaming, right? You're streaming content, and you're paying a fee for to stream content. So how how can they compete in the same space? They're all doing the exact same thing. What's different? The, what they do, like who the TV show. So that's a target market, right? They're going after people that want to watch TV shows and not wait till they come out on in their full season. What does Netflix do? I guess they do it all. But they also send, they also send DVDs, which is how they originally started. But they kind of do it all. Um, what does VidAngel do? They want people who want filtered content. What does Amazon Prime do? Sells you pretty much anything for cheaper price. But what, what about their streaming service? What, what, who's their target market? It's their specific Amazon Prime customers, right? And so because they're each servicing a different customer, they're all able to, to succeed in this marketplace. Now, yes, some are doing more better than others. Some are burning through a lot more cash than others. Some of them have separate products, but they all exist in the exact same space. You don't have to come up with this completely new concept. If you can find a division of a market that is not being serviced by the current, by the current companies that are out there, you have found a, a business. And you just have to make sure that that, con that, that um, target market is big enough that you can cover your overhead of what it's going to cost you to run this company per month or to get, in, in the case of streaming, the content to show the videos or to get whatever it is that you're doing. So as, as I'm being pitched these businesses, I saw everything from food, um, Native Foods, if you've ever heard of that company, they do vegan only, fast, casual, um, mainly out in California and out Chicago area. Um, we did an uh, oil company that did transportation of oil from the Balkan in North Dakota to the railheads so that they could transport the oil to the refineries. Um, we did a high-tech battery company that was competing with Tesla for a Navy railgun project that, when I was doing it, was completely top secret, and so we had to get a security clearance to do that investment. Um, and now it's, you can go watch it on YouTube. It's called the Navy Railgun Project. It's, it, they shoot a projectile with just electricity off of ships. Um, yep, super cool. It's, it's amazing. Go, go look at it. it. They can shoot it at Mach 7, which is unbelievable. 45 minutes from LA to New York, they can shoot something out of the air. It takes 45 minutes to travel that fast. Um, but um, so we, I mean, everything. We saw companies that were taking Chinese Chinese 3D uh, or laser printers putting American software in them and selling them for a much cheaper than what the American laser companies were selling them for. That guy was doing uh, 10 million in, in, in that business. It was just him and his wife and they were not technical. All they did is find a product, find a software, put them together, resold it. Um, so you can see that these businesses, now these businesses were all businesses between 10 million in revenue and 50 million in revenue, doing about 10% EBITDA, which is a earnings multiple, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's the number that they use to kind of value a company. And so 10% EBITDA mean they were doing a million dollars in profit or more. Um, and, and so these companies had kind of gotten past that hurdle, but we stood in, we stepped in because they weren't bankable yet, so they weren't to the size that they could go get bank money. Um, they were too risky still, um, but they didn't want to go straight VC where they're giving up 25% of their company for money. So we, we kind of sat in the middle of that, that, those two relationships. Um, so these companies kind of proven concepts at that point. Uh, but through that process of sitting at VC, um, at the VC firm, we, uh, we kind of um, were investing in a lot of these small startup companies. And there was one specifically in Nevada called Just College. They had just moved out of the Bay Area. And they were a collegiate tour provider 
for spring break destinations, uh, for sorority and fraternity formals, anything along those kind of lines of large group travel. Our largest trip that we do is about 10,000, 12,000 students. Um, our smallest, we won't do really anything under 100 people. Um, and so these are large, large groups, so there's a lot of logistics, a lot of, a lot of things that come into play. You're dealing with a lot of vendors and the travel industry as a whole is a very small, small margin business. And so we, they brought me in um, as they were looking for investment and their books were just an absolute mess. So if there's one piece of advice I give you when you start a company, hire an accountant. Hire a good accountant, whether that person you give them equity or you pay them, get an accountant in your, your startup because it causes you to not do a lot of things that a startup needs, which is get money. You need capital to run a business. The number one rule of business is never run out of cash. If you run out of cash, you're in a really poor position to go raise money because they know you need them. They will, they will ding you massively on the valuation of your company and take large portions of that company from you in order to um, keep, keep the business afloat. So while we were with just college, uh, we, we pretty much took the company and we saw that they told me, okay, we're going to make $400,000 this year. When I came in, I came in with that expectation that they were going to make $400,000. They lost $400,000 that year and didn't even know it. They, they had no idea because their books were such a mess that there was money in the bank. So they thought they were making tons of money, but it was, they were using future cash flows to operate the business today. And so they were like, you would pay me for a, for a trip that you're going on in 12 months. I would use that money right now today to pay for the events that are taking place this month. So it was kind of a Ponzi scheme, um, but not to that extent. They didn't do it on purpose. Um, but, we, but all we had to do is we just had to take a different look at the business. We had to look at it from, from the ground up, rebuild the organization. We had to take the processes that we were running through the business and see where we were bleeding out money. It was as simple as our operations girls were also our sourcing girls. And so they were calling up the vendors and then running that relationship all the way through. But this was their call. They'd call up the vendor and say, how much do you charge for 50 tickets to this destination? And the person would say this. And then they say, OK, great, thanks. And they hang up. So anything wrong with that? No. They didn't know that there was anything wrong with that. But they never asked, is that the best price they could do? They wrote that down and then they sent that off to the customer. They never took comparable estimates. They never made the business compete against themselves and against other divisions of airline or hotels. And so because of that, you know, people want business. People want customers coming through the door. So if you are giving them an opportunity to, to compete for your business, they're willing to compete. They're willing to negotiate, but if you never ask, I, I ask at Walmart. I go into Walmart and if I know that there's a better price somewhere else, or even if I don't know that there's a better price somewhere else, I say, can I talk to a manager and, and is this really the best price you can do? And you'd be shocked. They 90% of the time will say, yeah, we can knock 10 bucks off that or 20 bucks off that. And you can do that at any store. You can do that anywhere. Negotiation and sales as a whole, I'm a terrible salesman, but life is sales. Life is sales and you're selling yourself to a job in a job interview, you're selling ideas to a team. If you don't like sales, you better get over that because your entire life will be full of sales. You're selling yourself to a potential spouse. Um, I mean, you, you, that life is sales. And, and so it's a big part of, of getting used to presenting ideas, presenting ways to do things, your logic of how you got through that. But as we fix this business, there were some things that I got frustrated with, so I ended up leaving last year to do consulting. So I consulted for Imagine Music Festival, which is a big EDM music festival out of Atlanta. They did 26,000 um, attendees per day this year, and last year we only did 15, so I helped them restructure their business so that they could be profitable. Um, and then I was consulting back for my company because they wanted to sell the business. And so then I was brought fully back onto Just College, and now I'm there right now. Just Tours is what we changed the name to, and we are now selling the business to a company based out of Europe. Now with that um, comes a whole bunch of new stuff that I haven't even been through that process yet because we're in the middle of it right now. We should close on that um, deal in two weeks. So we'll, we'll be owned by a new company in two weeks. Um, now, so I was... Through, through all of this, there's, there's some things I learned. And the number one thing that I think you can do as a benefit to you is to check yourself. 
you have to be self-aware when it comes to your strengths and your weaknesses and be vulnerable. People want to work with people that are vulnerable because when you are willing to say, yeah, guys, I really suck at this. I really am not the best leader when it comes to whatever it may be. My communication may suck. I, I, I mean, you have to be self-aware and realize that those, as you start to write some of these things down and say, okay, I really suck at this. I really am not the greatest at this. I wish I understood more of what my developers were saying. Whatever it is, you need to start writing some of those down and start knocking things off your list. Nothing helps you gain more confidence as you check things off of a list. And as you say, okay, yeah, it was a weakness. Now it's more of a strength. Yeah, I could be better, but that one's off the list. And even get down to the nitty gritty of your life. I used to bite my fingernails. Couldn't stand it. I, I would be sitting in a bank meeting biting my fingernails in front of these, these people and I, it was embarrassing. And so I was like, how do I fix that? So I, uh, on my key ring over there, there's nail clippers. I told my wife, anytime she sees me biting my nails to tell me. I told all the people I work with in the same office that if they see me biting my nails to tell me. So now I don't bite my nails, I bite my cuticles, which is worse because then they bleed. But I'm fixing that too. That's on the list to, to knock off. But like go through that list, find those things that you, it could be the dumbest thing you waste too much time on Facebook. I, that was one of my weaknesses. It was on my list this year. I don't have Facebook on my phone anymore because it was just a mind-numbing thing I could do while I was laying in bed. Didn't communicate with my wife or, or I would be sitting. It, it, there, those are the types of things that as you start to understand who you are, I know I, I have addictive personalities. I know that those things, so I don't drink. I don't do some of these things because I know what it would do to me. I saw what it did to siblings of mine. I, and. And so you just have to be aware of who you are as a person and be okay with that. And if you don't like something about yourself, fix it. Get people involved to help you fix it. There is no problem being vulnerable to your friends, to your family, to people that care about you, and they will help you. Um, I have, I'm running out of time. but So that one's huge. And the, the, the second one is be... be um, willing to invest in yourself. I can't tell you how many times employees come into my office, be, me being the CFO with the money, they come in and say, hey, we think you should buy this for us. And this may be a monitor or something like that. And, and they're, they're, they're selling me, right? They're saying, this is going to make me so much more efficient. They see that I have two monitors sitting in front of my, my screen. So I have three monitors I work off of. And, and I say, so, okay, so tell me how much time this is going to save you and they start doing the math and I said and I, and I, and I turn to them and I'm probably not the, I don't always handle it the best way but I turn to them and say so if that monitor costs you a hundred bucks how much is that costing you if you get to leave two hours early every day because you can get more work done so be willing to go and don't expect somebody else to invest in you it, be willing to invest in yourself I bought those two monitors because I knew it was going to help me I bought a wireless mouse because I knew it was going to help me um, and, and I, I pay for Audible because I want to I wanna be better in certain areas of my life, wherever it may be. I don't care if it's business, if it's family related, if it's something completely obscure and out of the norm. Be willing to invest in yourself because if you want people to invest in you someday, you have to show that you've been willing to invest in yourself. And make hard choices to, to do that, right? Giving up, sacrifice something to do it if you have to. It is well worth your investment to invest in yourself before you invest in anything else. Um, I won't talk about the last part, but the brief plug is start a business in college. Nothing will set you off, out, out of heart more than, and it doesn't have to be anything special. You can go wash windows, you can go detail cars, you can go do anything, but start a business. Any questions? And if you're going to lunch or tonight, you can ask these questions also, but someone's got to ask a question. Right off the bat, I was in the entrepreneurial okay. series, I mean, club last year, last semester with you. I identify that you have the ability to identify waves really quickly, and then you hop on those waves and you ride those waves. What steps would you encourage us to help like, identify so, just because it's trendy doesn't mean it's the next, like Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's every, on everybody's mind. Just because it's trendy right now doesn't mean it's going to be around forever. 
there's been lots of things that have been trended that come and go. Um, it's not so much of finding a wave, it's finding a market, really. It's finding somewhere that it doesn't have to be the multi-trillion dollar market. I mean, tra travel as a whole nation or globally is $11.7 trillion market. It doesn't have to be an $11.7 tri trillion market. It can be a million dollar market. And if you start a business in a million dollar market and you capture 20% of that, or 10% of that, or 50% of that, that's a place to start. And then you and then you find ancillary products or complementary services like, like you have a movie theater. People have to get to the movie theater, people eat before the movie theater, find the other things that people do along that process of getting there, being there, leaving there, maybe they need babysitting, maybe they need this, add a little product here or there, maybe you open up a babysitting center next to the movie theater, maybe you offer a, a service that comes and picks people up and brings them out and kind of really lumps it into the price of the movie ticket. You, you just have to think through it from a different angle. Don't look at it from how that business is operating right now because they're already doing it. They're already operating it that way and they've already captured a certain portion of the market. Find a market that's not being serviced even or not being serviced well and just solve one problem. Just one. Start there. And then you can look deeper into that. Does that make sense? Last question. Okay. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about partnerships? Is it worth it? Have you seen more success? So, I, you, you'll hear both sides of this, and they're very different opinions. I would rather bring a lot of people along for the journey, and have a really small piece of a massive pie. Right? There was a there was a guy that did some art at the Facebook headquarters. Some art, right? Did a mural on the wall. He made, I think it was like $18 million at the IPO for doing mural on the wall, right? So he had a, I think he had less than a, a percent of a percent. And that's all he needed in that big of a company. Now, I'm not saying that you are looking to start the next trillion dollar, multi hundred million dollar company, but I'm, I'm of the opinion that I'd rather bring people along for the ride because I know I have a lot of weaknesses. I know I don't, I can't know everything and I can't do everything. And so I would rather bring smarter people than me and allow them to do what they're good at and us work together as a team and to sit and counsel with each other and to then come back with the best concept or idea. But don't ever do a 50-50 partnership. Those don't work. Someone has to have controlling interest, voting interest. Someone has to be a sit on the board as the president. Someone has to be the final if you can't come to an agreement, they're the final decision maker. There has to be. If you're a 50-50 partner, businesses get stuck and they, and they don't grow past that. Most businesses fail not because they don't have a good idea, but because of per personnel issues. They can't move past issues like that. That, that you just won't do it because you're stuck. Legally, you're stuck. You, you gave them half your business and half of the decision making ability. So. <clears throat> Oh, 20 after. Oh. Okay. So we got some time. So let me tell you one story. Funny story. I'm sitting, and then I'll come back to you. I'm sitting in a bank meeting with Just College, okay? So, so you, you always want to be, so here, here's two pieces of advice. Even if you're content with where you are in life, in your job, go interview. That is a skill set that you lose if you're not doing it. Go interview often. If you, can, if you can go see what else is out there, who cares if you like what you're doing? It empowers you once you stay. Because if you decide that you turn down something that you were willing, to, that somebody gave you, that empowers you to say, I'm here for a reason because I had this offer and this offer and this offer, and I said no to those. So let's make this work. Let's, make, let's, let's remember why, I'm staying, why I stayed here, why I didn't go to these other places. Do that often. While I was at Ernst & Young, yeah, I didn't love my life, but I was interviewing every, I think every few weeks, I'd go interview at one of the companies that was trying to get me to come on board. And I turned down, I think, 20. And every day I'd show up after turning one down, I was reinvigorated to be there because I decided not to take that. And then, um, so, so one piece of advice is that doing that. So as we're, it's the same in business. Like if you have a bank, go and review other banks. You may think that, that bank's horrible, and you may find they're just as good as anybody else. 
So we were going to interview a bunch of banks because we were mad at Chase. And I'm sitting there in a meeting and I'm telling this person in my background and I'm and this lady sitting across from me, she's like, oh, you were at Ernst & Young. Were you there during like 91 to 93? And I was like, ma'am, I was four years old. <laughs> and so even if you have a bald head at a young age, use that to your advantage. They thought I was a lot older and a lot more experienced. I definitely wasn't. I, you know, I was 28 then when, uh, when that meeting happened, but I was mistaken for like 43, 44, 45. So not the greatest part of my life, but go ahead. So uh, I was curious uh, uh, on the VC side of things, what were some things that you looked for in, um, in companies to invest in, both in terms of the, the presentation and also in terms of the that's, so that's a great question, right? Because I get asked that one a lot and I always kind of forget that that's a big part of the process. So number one, because of where we sat in the market, we wanted to see that they've proven their concept and that they had enough competency in that area of where they were working that they could continue down the road as a going concern is what stupid accounting term, as a company that's going to continue into the future. And so... Um, so that's the, that's the first off. If, if, if they can't prove that, they're probably too risky of, a, of an investment for what I was doing. Um, the, next, the next thing you want to look at is look at, look at the sacrifices the founders have made. Um, it's tough to come into a business. So, so I won't give the name of the company. But we went into a business. The guy had an amazing business. He was doing very well. Um, he was also paying himself a hundred thousand dollar salary which is not bad who cared about that we didn't care about that but then through members member draws which is what you can do when you hold equity in an LLC he was taking like three hundred fifty thousand dollars of member draws and, and pulling it out of the company but yet he was asking us for money to fund his company and so I saw a huge red flag I brought it up with my my team and they're like nope we're still investing so Years down the road, come back to, to my old company. I just came to their offices and talked to them. I said, whatever happened to them? So he kept pulling money out, and we had to pull out, and we lost $100,000 doing that deal. So why is that an issue that he was pulling $350,000 out? Anybody have an idea? Why was that an issue? Reinvesting it back into the company. Exactly. So he could have turned that $350,000 in, inside of a company potentially to two million or to five million. But yet he was pulling it out to buy things to live a lifestyle that he wanted to live. Now that's fine if you're not trying to raise money. That's fine if that's just gonna be how you run this business. If it's just gonna be a cash cow, let it be a cash cow. Don't go raise money though. And so I told them, you're never gonna convince that guy to stop living that lifestyle after he's tasted it. Because he was pulling out not just 50 extra thousand, it was 350 extra thousand so three and a half times more than what he had paid himself in, in, in a salary so that was that was one big thing that you want to look at is what types of sacrifices are the founders making how do they treat their employees what are they paying their employees when you have a founder making five hundred thousand dollars in a startup and another employee making twenty six thousand dollars bare minimum that's a that's probably an issue in morale there's probably an issue in taking advantage um, so you look at little things like that. You look at things like um, cleanliness of the office. They know you're coming in. So do they, do they respect you enough to at least make it look like it's in order? Um, at least sometimes hide some of the trash? You know, that there's big, when, when someone can't even keep, and, and I don't care if it's spotless, I don't care, but if you have like trash from, you can tell it's old trash in an office, you can only imagine how the inside workings of that company are, are if the external parts of their company look that bad. Um, so things like that. Um, and appearance is everything, right? Appearance is everything. So if you are sitting in front of me and you feel, sound arrogant, you feel like you deserve this money and we just should give you this money because you're the coolest guy out there and you're, you're the smartest one out there. That's probably a, a recipe for disaster because when you come to give them advice after you've given them millions of dollars and you give them advice and they kind of say, you're an idiot, you don't know near what I know, they're probably going to be the people that stubbornly kill their company because they just, just aren't willing to listen. So th those are a lot of things that we looked for. Um, but yeah.
So in, in that context, you will see that what do you think the because it's always like a battle between management and leadership in the startups. Um, what do you think is more important, like the management or leadership of the person who's doing? So they should never be separated. <coughs> management and leadership should never be separated. If you are not, if if you lack ability and leadership because you haven't been a part of leadership. That is an area that if you want to start a company, you have to get some competencies. You have to be willing to take criticism from your employees and not even just take criticism, but actively seek it out. So when I first came on to just college, there was some morale issues and I knew why there were morale issues because I was an outsider looking in, but the management that was there previously did not. And so I recommended that we send out a survey to everyone in the company and allow them to objectively give us criticisms based on criteria that we put in the survey. And when we got that back and I delivered it, so I mixed up everybody's answers so no one knew who was who and how they wrote it. I rewrote some of them so that I, they wouldn't be able to tell who it was. And I represented this at our executive meeting and I said, all right, so here, here's the feedback, here's your ratings, here's everything. And the CEO and the VP of sales flipped, flipped out. They were upset because someone had really criticized their leadership ability. And I said, whoa, 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 let's take two seconds. The fact that you're reacting this way shows me that you're not mature enough to understand that like you, you might be kind of living in a bubble. You might see it completely from one point of view, but if your employees see it that way, you're never going to have the performance from your employees that you need because they're not willing to go lay on the sword for you. They're not willing to work the extra 10 hours a week for you because they think you're taking advantage of them. So if you separate management and leadership and you say one's more important than the other, you're going to hurt, you're going to hurt your prospects of being able to bring on good people because good people came into our business and left because of the leadership management relationship. They, the, our management was not great leaders when it came to, to hearing people out, taking criticism, and actively changing themselves. Does that make sense? I think we're out of time. Questions at lunch, I, I'm more than willing to answer. If you